All right. Uh, hi, Mr. Franks. Thank you so much for joining me today for this interview. Um, Curtis Franks is currently the general counsel of the 2026 FIFA World Cup, and he is a member of the Tulane Law School class of 2005. And he's done a really a lot of awesome things throughout his career that we're going to talk about today. So I just want to say thank you for joining me. And I'm really excited to have this conversation. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's great. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So um, prior to entering this industry, you had your first internship with the Atlanta Hawks. And coming straight into that, what was your perception of minorities in the field? And how did that encourage or deter you from continuing to pursue a career in sports? Uh, let's see. My perception was that there weren't that many of us. <laughs> so, um, uh and so it really didn't deter me and encourage me because of a couple of things. One, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of just break into the field and be new and something different and unique in that, that, that part of it. But I think the biggest thing for me was um, that I had two VPs that were working for the Atlanta Hawks that were both minorities. And they were one of the two minorities that sat on the entire executive team that gave me the opportunity. The, the VP of uh, business development and VP of community development were two of the three people that I kind of report. And for me, they saw something in me and they gave me that opportunity. And so that was also encouraging for me to see them in positions of at the executive level that I could do some things. And so it was always encouraging for me to kind of look at them as, as mentors and as examples of what I could be. So it helped. But overall, and if you look at the industry at the time, when I kind of first came in, it was not that many minorities. It was, you know, we were kind of sparse, particularly at executive levels. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I didn't see it as a, as a deterrent. So I just, as, a, as a goal of mine to kind of get to that level yeah. where I want to be. That's awesome. Um, so you mentioned that you kind of worked in community development and business development with the Hawks. And did you feel like your experience as a minority kind of affected how you approached the community development side of that? Is there anything in particular that really stood out to you? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. So for me, you know, Atlanta is my hometown. So it was me just being in my element in the place where I was and kind of helping out. So my job was to um, really kind of develop community programs and, and to kind of do contracts and partnerships and different things that, that um, the Hawks wanted to do. So it was the opportunity for me to just kind of go in places that I was used to going to. So boys and girls clubs, community centers and things like that, things that I had grew up and been a part of in the Atlanta area already and kind of just felt uh, a good fit for me. And I actually, I absolutely love that job because it was just, it, it felt like it was just easy work for me. It was easy to kind of go in, go to places, go to kids and kids love to see when you come in, you're part of the Hawks and you're part of the whole thing. We want to go with it. So it was a, it was always a, you were welcomed. It was not a never a shunning or anything that you wanted to go. Every time, every time we went to some of these things, we were definitely welcomed with open arms. So I think definitely me being a minority, particularly in Atlanta, where the majority black city. So, <laughs> you know, you're you're going in, you're in the majority, you're going in places like that. That definitely helped me in that particular role where I was going. And I just loved, enjoyed it. I loved it. So it was, it was a benefit for me in the job that I was doing because I was a hometown person doing business development, doing community development, and kind of working on legal things in a city that is, you know, majority uh, African-American, so it's great. So speak, kind of going off of that, you went from this environment where it was very comfortable and it was what you knew in your hometown, and then you went to working in professional golf, um, both at, at Coca-Cola and NBC Sports, and we kind of talked about how that was a, definitely a culture shock and a shift for you. So how, what was your experience like in the professional golf world? What were you surprised by and kind of how did you handle that? Yeah, um, it was very vastly different. I went from being in Atlanta with the Hawks, where, you know, you being in the city of Atlanta, seeing people that look like you was a regular occurrence and going to things. And then I moved to Orlando with NBC Sports to kind of work on the golf aspects of it. And then walked into the golf world and was definitely reminded every day just by me being there that I was the minority. Yeah. So you're sitting in meetings and most of the time you're around white males. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you go to meetings on with the tour and you go to other places that are around golf and the ancillary businesses that are associated with golf, the equipment manufacturers and everything else. And it's and it's white males. You're going to a lot of country clubs and a lot of things that we were doing. And you go to these country clubs and these places and the people who are 
there that the people that are minorities are usually kind of workers and not there. And so people who are there partaking in the services, most of them are white males. So it was a bit of a it was a bit of a culture shock for me coming from that. I was kind of used to that already because I went to the I grew up in Atlanta, but went to the University of Georgia mm -hmm. and had that culture shock there where I grew up in Atlanta, where I was the majority and then went to the University of Georgia, University yeah. of Georgia and find out I was the the vast minority. Yeah. So I kind of had the experience there in my undergrad world of having what it was. And it felt like that same thing, kind of going into a space again and realizing like, wow, I am really the minority. I'm really the only person here in the room. And you hear that you just kind of it, it, it's a different it's a different um feeling you kind of go to those places and people make remarks and kind of realize that remarks are you know a little bit on the offensive side yeah they kind of, kind of kind of being racist at times yeah really all white people there. sorry so, was, they definitely yeah approach so the you kind of go on they yeah. don't really definitely yeah, so they don't realize that they're coming yeah how they come across what they're saying how they do those things it's a it could be a bit of a um it's a, it's a challenge because you want to be professional, but you also don't want to be disrespected. And mm -hmm. also, and you also, and, and the other thing is too, I think a lot of times that happens in these spaces, it happened in Georgia and it happened a lot in golf, you become the voice of the minority. And so an opinion that happens that they want to kind of get the opinion of what a minority thinks and everything else, they look for you to kind of provide the perspective of the group as a collective. And you just have to kind of remind them like, this is Curtis's opinion. I think I speak for a lot of Black people, in my experience, is maybe particularly Black males, but Black females may feel differently. Somebody else may feel differently and has a different voice. And we're not just a monolith in how we think about things and where we want to go with it. And so you always kind of have to kind of just, you know, couch that in like, you know, we're a lot alike, but we're also a lot different. And we don't all think of it the same and everything else. So it, it, for me, it was just a, um, it can be a little bit exhausting at times. Like yeah. you have to kind of just make sure that you're always on, you're going to make sure that you're not kind of, you know, perpetuating what other people feel like are stereotypes of you know you as a as a minority and what you want to do so you're very cautious about how you interact with people how you write emails how you respond to things how you deal with conflict and how you do those things like that and and you're really it's a lot of um something that I think a lot of a lot of black people face in corporate America already but I was kind of like really heightened when you're kind of really the one of the few minorities in this space. There were a few other of us that were there, but we were definitely in the vast minority compared to other places that I work. So yeah. It's interesting. It was it was um I did love the job. I don't want to kind of come across like I didn't like the job. I like yeah. the job. I like the people and everything else. But it is you do recognize that you are a minority in those places where you are. It is just kind of those things like I, when you're the majority you have to you don't think about it because you don't see how what you're saying is affecting the minority because you just don't have to worry about it. So yeah. Definitely. And now that you're in a leadership executive position, do you think that experience has changed how you approach minority employees below you to make sure that they don't feel like they have that type of burden on them? Yeah, I definitely do. I, I, I've, I've, I've had instances where I'm, I'm very keen on how we interact with each other, how we say things, how things come across when it hits my ear wrong. So even if somebody it's not saying it directly to me, somebody sending it to somebody else. If it hits my ear wrong, I'm definitely going to the person who said it to say, look, I think that you might have, you might want to kind of understand why that may have come across in the way that you didn't expect it to come across. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I definitely kind of approach it in a way where I'm doing that. And I also just try to make sure that I have an inclusive view of what it is. I'm very, if you ask my staff now, I'm very, they call me the most democratic person I've ever worked with because <laughs> I'm kind of because <laughs> I just want to make sure that I'm hearing all the views and all the things within the room because I felt like sometimes when I was sitting there I, you know your voice gets drowned out mm -hmm. even if you're not purposely there you feel like you have to kind of force your way into the conversation I don't want to feel like anybody has to do that I want to kind of open it up and make sure that everybody has the opportunity to do it that way so I think those experiences of me feeling like I was kind of you know lost or not really seen or not you know not heard as much as I felt like I maybe could have been maybe because I, you know, maybe because it wasn't really there, but sometimes I kind of drown myself out because I didn't want to kind of push the envelope or do some things like that. I try to make sure I have an open and welcoming um, presence for the people that I work with now so that they can feel comfortable going with that and doing that. And I feel like they have to kind of shy away from things and doing that in the way that I kind of felt like I know I felt that way sometimes when I was in more of the minority place where I was, so. Yeah, for sure. Um, so then after your time in professional golf, you moved on to a role at the NCAA. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about what you did over there and what your experience was like in that position? 
Yeah, so I was working in the ECAA and that was a really cool job too. So I had responsibility for, for I would call it, I call it most of the revenue generating functions. So it was really all of their champ, all 90 of their championships, um, legal law side, all the 90 of their championships, all of their uh, sponsorships, all of their media partnerships, and then also manage their IP portfolio. So that was kind of like the main job. And then I worked on two big projects while I was there as well, kind of assisting and helped it out kind of like the changes to the transfer rules, which now, you know, everybody knows what the transfer portals and these NCAA. Yeah. So I helped on that one. And then I also was kind of one of the primary lawyers that helped and assisted on, on the changes in the rules to NIL there as well. So um, that was a good job. I like I liked, I liked that job in that it gave me, it was a lot. I, for me, I felt like that was where I really use every single skill that I had from a business standpoint, but also from a lawyer standpoint to understand that because so many big things happened. Not only was it just me doing the day-to-day -day jobs and working those two big projects, also during that time, I um, also uh, was in the middle of a pandemic where we had to cancel all 90 of our, all of our championships for an entire year. And if you ever want to learn how to be a lawyer and dealing with everything from negotiations to, you know, contract things to litigation to everything else like that one, like it was a year in my house <laughs> doing all of those things sure. <laughs> from home and just making sure that the NCAA, you know, found a way to come out of that with, with essentially having zero revenue. Like, I don't know what company can go and survive in the way that we did with zero revenue for an entire year. But like all the things you had to do from an insurance standpoint, from you know, legal standpoint, doing that. And it was crazy. That was, I think I learned a lot from that. That was a great growth and learning experience. And I did that at a, at a time when my wife and I, we had a three-year-old and a one-year-old in the house as well for oh. an entire year doing that. Wow. So it was, that was, it was a lot. So, yeah, those uh, are two like- That was a year. That was a year. You find out if you really love somebody, like we can we survive <laughs> that. We can, we can survive a lot <laughs> <laughs> we, I'm, we learned that we really do like each other like we really do like you know we, I'm we, glad. We, yeah you figure that out so um so, so given that tumultuous nature of how the NCAA was during your time there were there times that you felt like as an executive there you had to compromise maybe some of your own values and how you felt that athletes should be treated in order to achieve goals that the larger NCAA wanted and if you did kind of how did you work through that and deal with it yeah, I want to say I don't. I don't think I, if anybody knows me, I don't think I ever compromised any of my own personal values. Mm -hmm. So I never, I never got to a point where I felt like I'm doing something that's there. I, I, everybody who kind of knows me knows I'll just quit before I have to kind of yeah do that. So I'm like, yeah, it's not worth it. Like you can have it if you want to do it that way. Mm -hmm. But I will say, I, for me and for other other folks that were there, including former student athletes who worked at the national office and in Indianapolis and other people who look like me and other black males who were there with us. We were definitely, I was very vocal. And if you ask me about the NIL situations and things like that, everybody kind of knows I was very vocal about the rules and some of the things that I felt like, you know, some of the ways that we wanted to go. And so for me, I always made sure that I got my voice heard when I felt like something just wasn't right. Because for me, I mean, to be honest with you, we, we understood what, what we were, like the revenue generating sports are men's basketball and uh and football like those are the two primary drivers for most of the revenue that pays for everything that's within college athletics and who makes up the majority of that are going to be black males that yeah. that do that and so for me it was very important that that when i saw things that weren't that just didn't feel right to me or do some things like that that i kind of was vocal about why we did it now and for me being a legal, legal person giving legal counsel as not only just kind of like giving straight legal counsel to say, can you do this or can you not? That wasn't necessarily the answer. The answer was all the, 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 the answer was like, should you? Or giving the, or giving kind of the advice of like, you could do it, but like, why would you do this? Here's why this feels bad or why you don't need to do this and why you want to go with it. So I'm trying to make sure I always did that. And I'm still kind of giving advice to my old friends who are still left over there. And now they're like, why, what are you doing guys doing and kind of where you would go with it now? But I will say, I will say, yeah, there were definitely things that I will say I never kind of compromised my values, but I feel like there were at times that there were positions that NCAA take that I that I took that I didn't necessarily agree with. But as a lawyer, you're going to have that. Like my personal feelings on what we should do aren't also going to align with what the business decides it wants to do. And so you just kind of, for me, it was always just making sure that I was very that gave you good sound legal advice. And then where I felt like my opinion needed to be had because I felt like something wasn't right, I was always putting it out there and then doing what I need to do. And everybody kind of knows that that was my my take. So yeah, 
I feel proud. I feel proud. Like, for me, there's nothing I feel ashamed about or kind of looking at anything yeah. that I did. It. Like, I feel very proud about like being that vocal voice that I was when I was there. And anybody, you know, anybody, ask anybody in the national office, they kind of know that I had that vocal voice. I was there to say like, yeah, why are we doing this? Like, this is, yeah. and, and really saying like, really being honest and saying, this is dumb. Like, why are we doing this? <laughs> like, oh, why does this, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why are we continuing to do this? And, you know, and I also said to these double like, we're, we're kind of fighting fights we already lost. Like, we're already, we already lost this fight a long time ago, a lot of in public perception, or we're kind of losing these things. Why do we continue to fight a fight that we've already lost? And I think you've seen some of the changes that have happened that, you know, I'm not saying it was a direct result of me, but I think you're seeing a lot of the changes that are happening in college sports where they're kind of realizing that some of the fights they fight, they've kind of already lost and they're trying to adjust and change. Now, what this is going to be in the future, who knows? And, you know, I think there'll still be some resistance to it because I feel like people still want to kind of keep what college football or college sports as a whole was before. We'll see where it goes in the future. But I think you're seeing some changes now. Yeah, definitely. And was that like, vocalization and speaking up saying your opinion is that something you kind of have learned throughout your career to get better at or were you always kind of confident in saying your opinion oh no 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 it's something I had to go kind of... okay. <laughs> I'll say my first boss and uh, my first boss David Lee, Lee who was still there at the Atlanta Hawks he was one of the people saying like you were way too quiet because if you had anybody kind of really really knows me knows I'm an introvert I kind of am shy I'm not you know I'm kind of to myself I want to kind of keep it quiet and his thing to me was always like, if you're going to grow, you can't like, you just can't like, I can tell he could say like, you, you, it's like your emotions show up on your face all the time. And if you feel that way, you need to start saying some things. Yeah. Now, how you say it and what you say and how you kind of present it matters. So you got to be careful about what you do there. But like you, but like, you just can't be this quiet person. You're going to have to kind of get out of that shell if you want to grow and want to do with it. And so for me, I took that, that mentorship and that advice from him and kind of taking that on and done it. It, you know, I think I've gotten a little bit better at it. You know, I think I, when I kind of came out the gate, I was probably a little bit too brash with it. Like, hey, you know, let me say whatever. And I kind of have to kind of temper it back and deal with it. But I feel like I got better. By the time I got to the NCAA, it really was, a, I feel like I kind of got a good place where I can kind of put my opinion out there in a way that people understand that I was kind of coming in a really professional and respectful manner and not in a different way, in a different manner that was going to go there. But like, it took some time. Like, it's not, a, it's a, it's a nuanced thing. And particularly being a minority, and you know, the, again, the stereotypes that happen, you gotta, gotta, you know, gotta be careful about how you say some things because yeah. I think, like, you know, it's just unfortunately, you, you know, you you don't feel like you have the same leeway that other people get, so you have to go that by that way. So you have to learn, and it's something I definitely learned. Um, so speaking of supervisors that had really big impacts on you after the NCAA, you returned back to Coca Cola, and you had a supervisor there that we talked about that had a really positive impact on you and can you tell us just a little bit more about him and how he impacted you as a minority, um, oh, sorry, as a minority in your field and how that made you a better leader moving forward? Yeah, so I got to give a big shout out to Liv Johnson, who is the, the, the VP and the Social General Counsel at Coca-Cola, who was my boss when I was, my, the last time I was there, who is a great friend to me and a great mentor to me. And I told Liv this a lot of times and I think I'll, I'll tell him to, to this day, like he is, probably the first boss that I felt like really saw me through and through. Like, so he, we had similar experiences in our, our professional careers and how we brought up similar challenges and the same things we want to go. So when he heard me speak, I could tell that he understood what I was saying, why I was feeling it. And I understand that he kind of felt that way he wanted to go with it. And so he, his advice to me and how he wanted to go, that was, was really something that I was able to take in because I felt like he actually was giving it to me in a way that I could digest it in a way that I just never had that with any other boss mm -hmm. that I had. And I also felt like he was a per, he was a good boss for me because he actually looked out for me and understood why, what I wanted out of my career and looked out for me and was a great sponsor for me, not only a friend, but a good sponsor, a great mentor, a big kind of popping me up and doing what I need to do. And gave me the leeway and gave me the, you know, the the um the growth the growth opportunities and things I need to go from that. So for me, that was a and Liv is, and I say this because Liv is another black male. And so for me, that was a big thing for me to see somebody that looks like me and that understands my challenges, understands the things that I've been through in my career because he's been through them and he's been through more of it because he's more senior than me. So he understands that. And that was a big, huge thing for me to kind of go from there and to listen from that. And for him to to welcome me and to open me up to kind of be a mentor for me and do it that way and do it in a friendship way is was an invaluable thing that I just never had with anybody in my career. So he's like, yes, I have, I've had some great bosses, 
Yeah, so I'm not gonna say today, but like Liv is kind of but like the best boss I've had because he he just kind of hit all the the notes for me. And so that was big for me. That was a big thing for me. And it made um it made my life at Coke uh very easy, very welcoming, made me want to continue to work for Liv and do some things where we wanted to go with it. It also made it very hard for me to leave because for me, I was a little bit afraid of not having that again. And so making the decision to leave Coke to come to my current role where I am now was a hard decision. And most of the reason that it was hard was because of Liv yeah. and because of how great he was for me there. So for me, it was a it was a it was a refreshing change to um actually have somebody that I'm just kind of like, man, you really see me, all of me, all the way through that I don't think in ways that other bosses who've been great and been great mentors to me could, could do the same that Liv could. Because I mean, again, it's just something about being another black male that understands the experiences that you go through in the nuances of kind of being in this country and being in corporate America yeah, was something that was a unique thing for him. So for me, I've just tried to make sure that that um I take it like for me, I take a lot of the lessons for Liv that he kind of gave to me and kind of kept it and use them in my role. But I've done that for every single boss that I've had. So I don't want to kind of say that I haven't taken it out. Every boss that I've had, I've taken a little bit from each of them to kind of kind of build up what I wanted to do, plus my own, plus my own secret sauce and put it together, kind of go with it. But Liv was just kind of great. That was a great experience for me. And um, yeah, thanks to Liv. I, mean, uh, I talk to him all the time. So it's not like I'm I'm doing that, but I do want to kind of give him a good shout out because I do appreciate everything he did for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as you said, after your time at Coca-Cola, you moved on to your current role, general counsel of the 2026 FIFA World Cup. Um, so was there a specific role throughout your impressive career that you really think prepared you for this venture? Or obviously you just said you kind of take pieces of all of them, um, but is there one specific one that stands out? Oh man, if I had to pick one, probably the NCAA, just because of the, the nature of the role and all the things I had to go. But I think it was a, but for me, I feel like the building blocks of my career kind of built up for me what I have here. So the the event aspects of what I did at the NCAA, along with the sponsorship and the media and everything that I did were good building blocks. But working at Coke and being on the sponsor side and doing the things that I did there was another big piece of it. Plus being at NBC and working on the media aspects of things that I did there were big, huge building blocks of what I've done. But I, if I had to pick one role, it's probably the NCAA. Just because the NCAA just had so many challenges that uh, it's probably the only thing that's comparable to what I do now. Because I think everything else that I've done before, while they were big jobs and I kept having increasing responsibility, they were kind of niched in kind of some one little aspects of what I was doing. So at Coke, I was staying within the sponsorship space and marketing space. I wasn't dealing with everything that Coke had to deal with. Mm -hmm. And yeah, same thing kind of NBC. I was kind of dealing with kind of the media aspects and maybe some sponsorship things of what I was doing, but I wasn't dealing with every single aspect of everything that is NBC Universal. Here at the, at the World Cup, it's everything. So I'm dealing with yeah. everything about putting on the putting on the tournament, but that's everything from HR, employment related issues to you know, vendors to you know, uh human rights issues to you know, immigration, customs, all kinds of things that I'm dealing with and that thing. So I feel like the NCAA, just kind of the, the things that I had to go through at the NCAA to kind of work out during the pandemic, getting out of those things and dealing with all those things helped. It's probably the biggest driver for what I've done here and it helped what I've done, done so far. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Um, and then kind of starting to wrap up a little bit, how did to your time at Tulane Law in particular, especially in the sports law department, impact your career? And is there anything you learned from the sports law department or in law school in general that you kind of kept in the back of your mind throughout your career and kind of sticks with you to this day? Well, a few things. I, I was, I'll say the, the first thing that I probably heard it at Tulane when I came in was really the approach to the sports industry. And it was, this is a lightning, I mean, from, I'll never forget this because this is still stuck with me. This is a lightning strikes industry and you have to put yourself in a position for the lightning to hit you. I'll never forget that. I was like the first sports like group thing that we had when I was there way back in 2002 <laughs> so um so that I heard that and for me that's kind of stuck with me and for me that has um stuck with me because it's kind of allowed one making sure that I'm putting myself in the position for the light to hit me but also just putting that things in me to kind of say I got to be where I got to put myself in a position so I can't be stuck on one thing so I can't stay all the way in Atlanta if I want to grow and do some things like that, unless the opportunities are there. But if it's not there, you got to go where the lightning's striking. So yeah. that was one of the things that kind of helped me do that. And it made it a little bit easier. Again, me, this introverted person from Atlanta who would have stayed in Atlanta for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I've lived in, now I've lived in different cities and who knows where this FIFA thing is going to take me next to yeah. the next place where I want to go. 
with it, you know, me at me at, you know, in my 20s would have been a little bit more resistant to it. Me 20 years later or now feel like, yeah, that's where I can kind of go and do that. So I think that's one thing that's helped. I think too, really just kind of like the the reputation that Tulane has from a law school standpoint and just knowing that, you know, a lot of a lot of that's there, like that's a good thing. Like the the, the reputation precedes me. So people understand when I say I'm with Tulane, they're like, oh, you're in sports, you're a sports law program. So they kind of making that connection. That's helped me through that whole aspect of it. And then really just kind of like the friendships and the mentorships and the things that I've done and the connections that I've had from Tulane, that's kind of helped. Like, I mean, for me, like the, the people I went to law school with, I'm still friends with to, to this day and, and kind of keeping in contact with. I've met other people from other classes who I'm, you know, I'm friends with, who I made some contacts with and some things there. So it's been a good opportunity from a networking standpoint and a good community standpoint to continue to keep going that, that I'm really surprised by that I wouldn't have expected coming out of law school that that would have happened, but it, it really has. It's, it's been there. And that community is really that's there and is strong within the within the legal industry. And you know, going to sports lawyers every year and then coming to that, you know, that uh reception every single year where you see that everybody that went to Tulane, it's a big group. It's a huge group. And it's kind of yeah. just keeps strong where you really want to go with it. So it's a good, it's a good thing. So I was gonna yeah. ask if you ever run into any of your classmates or people from the class above you or below you just in your everyday life in the sports industry oh, with yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. Most definitely. So, like, yeah. So, like, uh, I love a couple of people like Lauren Estrin, who I went to law school with. We graduated the same year. She worked at Turner at the same time. I was working at NCAA. So we know each other. We ran into each other. We worked together. That helped because, see, like that that network and that connection that we had helped us work through a lot of things. Particularly when we got to negotiate, you know, a a, a, a settlement of what it's going to be for. Um, you know, our uh, not having the tournament in four years, but that that friendship and that thing, that connection that helped kind of ease what we need to do there. Her being able to introduce me to a lot of lawyers on the other side and doing that thing here helped me establish relationships there. So that's a good thing. And then, yeah, I run to other people, all kinds of things. You just, you go into people that you're working with on various different deals and venues and things, things like that. They went to Tulane. It's an easy connection to kind of make and where you can go with that no matter what class they went in. So it's a easy, it, it's a great community to to kind of ease into it, to kind of, that connection helps, you know, break a lot of ice that's out there. Yeah, I think that's encouraging for us as students because the sports industry obviously can seem very daunting, but I think we forget we have a community with each other. Yeah, it's daunting, but it's small. Like, I, I, that's all students say all the time. Like, <laughs> it's a big industry, but you realize how small it is when mm -hmm. you kind of kind of look at it. It's a small community, especially on the on the on the legal side. Even on even on the business side, but even on the legal side, it's small. And and it's not six degrees of separation. It's like two. Somebody can know somebody that's going to know you. And it doesn't take that much of a loop <laughs> to get to somebody that can really get a good assessment of you. So I do that a lot when I know for me personally, when I was going through hires, people could ask you about you and get you know it takes a couple of steps to get to you. And I know when I'm hiring, ask somebody else. I know somebody that used to work here at this thing at the same time, and I can go ask them about you and everything where to go with it. So I just say that to students to just be mindful of like, hey, it's not not a big industry, you know, it's not that big of a community. And it, it is very incestuous. I tell that all the time too. <laughs> Move around, we're in the same groups and the same things we're gonna go with it. But you know, you realize how it's big, but you realize how small it is when you kind of really get into it and you're and you're working in it. And then my final question. So given your impressive career and all of the different positions you've had, what do you consider to be your biggest career success or what are you most proud of yourself for accomplishing? Man, um, let's see. My biggest career success for me is I avoided the law firm. Like I <laughs> basically got to the general counsel position. Every sports law student's dream. Maybe. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I avoided the firm. And I'm, in, I'm in, sitting in a GC of the World Cup and I hadn't touched the firm. So that's a big kind of personal thing for me because I just didn't want to do it. However, I'm saying most people go to firms. That's going to be most people's path. But I'm just kind of an example that it is possible. Not that many of us, but it's possible. So I'll say that. I, for me, I, I think the other thing is too, just, just working on big, huge issues. Like for me, just knowing I had a... Uh, love it or hate it, I was involved with NIL. That's a big, huge change for, yeah. for college for college that's where it is love it or hate it i was involved with kind of the the transfer things um you know and then being involved in the things i did at coke and then i'll be a part of like for me and then here 
being a part of the World Cup, like it's really the biggest sporting event ever held in the world, ever. Like for me, that those big things and being a big touch point to those kind of big consequential things that are the sports industry, it's just a big accomplishment for me. And I think that's the biggest thing for me that like I'm able to say like, man, I've been part of these huge things. And that's a I like that's what makes the job fun. That's what makes me want to come and kind of keep doing it and going through every day. So I think that, that's the, probably the biggest accomplishment for me if I to talk about it. So. That's awesome. And yeah, you've accomplished amazing things. And I obviously I'm sure you're going to continue to do that, especially with your current position. Um, but thank you so much for joining me today. I'm sure everybody will love to hear everything that you said and you gave great advice. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Of course.